Hello and welcome to 18 WJTS Inform. I'm your host, Bill Potter. Well, he's back. State Senator Mark Mesmer joins us once again, as he does throughout the legislative session. And again, we appreciate you coming in on Fridays uh, with WJTS TV to kind of wrap up what's happened in the Senate and some of what has happened in the House uh, and to kind of let us know what, what bills you've got going on. Uh, so welcome to the show once again. Great to be here. It is hard to believe it's it's a, another session again. It just seemed like we finished this up a week ago, didn't we? Yes, it <laughs> seemed like it. Uh, let's start start off by kind of giving people an idea how will this session be this is a short session yep, this is a short session which uh, really anything with a budgetary impact we we typically don't handle I mean in a non-budget year I mean I think our Senate rules allow you know something with impact less than fifty thousand dollars to be considered but and I think the house has a similar threshold um, so if it's a small you know, fiscal impact. I mean, you just typically don't deal with, you know, big budgetary items in a non-budget year. So basically, this is going to end in March, where mm -hmm. last year it went, ended at the end of April. Right. Yeah. Last year, we were have to be done April 29th in a budget year. Last year, we got done a few days early, about the 24th, 25th. And this year, we have to be done by the 15th of March, but I think we're going to shoot to get done no later than March 11th, because the, the Big Ten tournament comes into town on the 12th, and we want to be out of town before, you know, that chaos hits in Annapolis. Okay, now let's talk about what, what has happened. This has been the first week. What's mm -hmm. been going on this week? Sure. Well, this week uh, we, we moved one bill through. It's, it, it'll be ready for final passage on Monday, Senate Bill 2. Uh, the House had House Bill 1001, which is, is the mirror bill to that, uh, just to making sure you know, one or the other didn't get hung up. Uh, but that bill, uh, last year we changed statewide testing from iSTEP to iLearn, brand new test format, new questions. Um, and, and anytime you have a, a new test, you're going to have a change in test scores. It happens across the country anytime you change you know, testing mechanisms. Uh, and, and the test scores did drop, which they anticipated. So if you had a A, B, C, D, or F you know, last year, if your test scores would have pushed you down into a lower grade category, your grade from last year remains your grade this year. Uh, if your grades, you know, stayed the same or you know went up, and you could possibly move up a grade, you know, a, a, a grade level in that A B C D F, it, it, the the hold harmless bill we're, we're working on Senate Bill Two um, allows you to move up, but does not allow you to move down, uh, and and we'll do that. And then after you get a a year under your belt of the new test then next time you take it, you have a comparison, an accurate comparison from, you know, one year to the next. Are you talking about the school corporation or the individual yeah. students? Uh, this would be school corporation okay. grade. So, so they get a grade, yes. just like a student gets a grade? Yes. Okay, based on the student's grades, that's what the, the school gets. So they're the hold harmless. Yes, yeah. okay. yep. And so that is up for final passage, I believe, in the House and Senate on Monday. Okay. Uh, and then, then we'll, that, those bills will flip you know, both bills to the other chamber. I mean, one or, one or the other of those bills has to pass both the House and the Senate. And then, in, so within another week, we should be ready for either of those bills or both of those bills to go to the governor for signature. What now will be some of the focuses, you think, in, mm -hmm. in this year's legislation? Uh, well, there's really a, a, the high-level items that really the House, the Senate, and the governor have all identified is, is um, how to try to cut health care costs for Hoosiers. I mean, it's been a uh, it's been a really, an, I mean, a, a, a continual problem for the last, you know, 20, 30 years. I mean, the cost of health care just continues to go up, and it's really gotten more pronounced the last few years. So there's not a lot we can do at the state level, but if there's anything we can do to help drive more competitiveness, which uh, one of the uh, bills we're going to work on is going to look at having hospitals, uh, medical service providers, uh, aggregate the cost for a specific procedure under what they call an all, all claims database system. So any, any, any patient who has a knee surgery, any patient who has, you know, arthroscopic surgery, any person, I mean, any type of appendicitis, you know, anything that they can categorize under a category for, for procedure, they'll, they'll aggregate those costs and then, and then make that data uh, readily available to the public. So if you have something that's life-threatening, obviously you're going to go the first place you can get. But if there's elective surgery of some kind you're going to have done, you know, even an MRI, there's a, there's a, uh, a facility in Evansville that, that would do, a, you know, you know, do any MRI for you know, a third to half the cost of what it would take at most hospitals, but all they do is MRIs. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the other costs associated with you know, supporting the, the MRI and all the staff. Um, 
but all of those, you know, all those elective type uh, services, really even non-elective, will be published out there for the, for the public. So you can say, well, I could go here or I can go here, and I could get it for, you know, X amount less, and it, it should drive some competitiveness into the healthcare market. Another big area that I've had constituents dealing with is uh, what they call um, surprise billing. So say you go to Memorial Hospital, you go, you go to get some, a procedure done of some kind, uh, Memorial Hospital is in your insurance company's network, but maybe one of the doctors that does one of the lab work or x-ray re reading, or you might have specialists within that hospital that aren't in, say, Anthem's network. And so you get a bill for the in-network claims, and then you get what, what, what's been termed a surprise bill from an out-of-network doctor within an in-network facility. Uh, and there's a couple ways we could tackle that. Uh, and so, you know, different states have done it differently, but I think 26 states have passed laws that prohibit surprise billing. If you go to an in-network facility, the insurance, insurance companies have to treat you as an as a in-network, you know, customer no matter who provides the service in that facility. And there's you know, different ways we can tackle it, um, but I'm quite certain that that'll get addressed. And then uh, the cost of prescription drugs, there's some things we can do to help drive some competitiveness and, and, and uh, you know, into that market. But uh, not a ton of options we have, but there are some things we can tackle, and, and, and I think we will. There's also some, some things we could save money in the, in the eye care uh, industry uh, under what, you know, what they call tele, telemedicine for eye care. It's, it's done in 45 of the 50 states. It's just not done in Indiana. I don't really like being one of the five of anything that's, you know, that's not yet allowed. So we'll tackle that. And then for people who are uh, sole proprietors, you maybe have no employees other than yourself or maybe one employee. There's nothing in the healthcare market for those people to go out and get insurance. If you have two employees or more, there's group plans, association plans, there's, you know, there's affordable, health, you know, affordable care, uh, you know, programs available, um, you know, for individuals, but there's nothing available for an individual, an employee, employer, sole proprietor who has either just themselves or one employee. Um, Farm Bureau's got a, a program. It wouldn't just be limited to farmers. It would be available to really anybody who's got a, a sole proprietor business like that that's been approved in, in two other states. It's not health insurance. It's it's more like the health the the religious groups that have the sh the share care programs, but it's it's set up to where they could they could sell it as a as a health care product, not necessarily health insurance, but would be significantly less expensive than than or you know or they have no option now. So, now, the uh, House and Senate, you, you've got some surplus money in mm -hmm. Indiana. What's we do. going to happen with that? So yes, at the at the end of last year's fiscal year, we finish our budget planning in April, well in May and June, the revenue forecast exceeded what we anticipated and we had about a $300 million additional surplus to what we had thought we would have come July 1. Uh, there was four or five university level projects, Purdue, IU, uh, Indiana State, di different, different u university level projects that we had approved them to, to go ahead and build uh, but, but do a 20-year a bond to pay for them. You know, and then they would have paid for them through you know, their, their normal revenues that they have. Um, if we pay, go ahead and, and pay cash for those, you know, through the, you know, through the state funds, it'll save $140 million in interest over the life of those projects. So what we have planned, and that's House Bill 1007, is to take $300 million of the of the extra money we had last year and, and pay cash for, what, the biggest one is the Purdue Veterinary Sciences Building. Uh, their vet school is, the original building they built back in the 40s and it's it's out of compliance and they're going to lose their their vet school certification if they don't build something new and that's about 80 million of that 300 million total that's the single biggest project uh, but that would that would allow them to you know pay pay cash for that out of state proceeds rather than you know finance it for 20 years and, and it's just better for the taxpayer to do that you have some bills, I'm sure that uh, mm -hmm. you've had two that went through committee today or this two, week, two, yep, and then uh, next week you've got some more. But you've got some bills. You're yep, I have filed nine so far. I might might file a tenth for one of the legislators who you know who's you know running out of room in his calendar. Uh, but two that I had heard this week that uh, one that got voted out of committee, uh, one we're going to hold to amend next week. But one de deals with uh, under your auto policy or your homeowner's policy. There's a there's a 
uh, extra clause you can get called medical payments benefit. So if somebody gets hurt at your house, uh, it, you, know, you can get five, 10, you know, 25, I mean, you can probably get as much as you want, but most homeowners have, or, and, and car owners have, you know, five to 10,000, what they call medical claims uh, payment you know, benefit. So it pays your out-of-pocket expenses, or it, it's supposed to. Uh, but sometimes uh, when you, if you go into the emergency room, they'll have you sign this little waiver that you really don't know what you're signing. And it's, it's one of, you know, tons of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and you waive the right to use that medical pay, med, med pay benefit for as you choose, they, they take it and, and apply it how they want. So you, you sign your rights away to that, to that insurance benefit that you thought you had. Um, and, in, and every hospital, every medical provider has through Anthem or United Healthcare or whoever the large insurance companies are, they have negotiated rates for whatever service they provide. And whenever they have you sign over a waiver to that medical, you know, med pay benefit under your auto policy or homeowner's policy, they, they, don't, they don't take the, the negotiated rate that they have with Anthem or United, they take the full retail cost and apply your med pay benefit to, to they, get, they get full retail rather than their, than their, their, their real uh, cost. Uh, so you as a consumer are paying, you know, two to three times uh, what you otherwise would and, and that product is not serving for you to cover your out-of-pocket expenses like you thought, thought it was when you bought it. So uh, that got a hearing. After the hearing was over, talked to some folks in the insurance world and the, and the uh, trial lawyers world and the hospital world and we're, you know, we're gonna try to make sure that that product for the consumer works like it's intended to be a supplemental policy and not your primary policy. Uh, and then another bill, um, the Office of Community and Rural Affairs uh, does shovel-ready site uh, gr grant programs that they work hand in hand with uh, Indiana Economic Development Corporation to administer, and that that statutory uh, agreement or whatever uh, procedure that lets that happen runs out this year. So it was a, really a simple bill, but but makes instead of that running through the, the end of the end of this fiscal year, it, it will it will make that switch permanent unless the governor or lieutenant governor decides they want to switch it back. So. Uh, kind of an administrative thing, but still, uh, some we've moved some things from the governor's office to lieutenant governor or lieutenant governor to governor. Just who wants to administer the program and what what agencies do they oversee that that uh, that handles those? But the shovel ready sites project will go to Okra, you know, permanently if, if if that bill moves on through, which I don't expect it to have any trouble. And then next week you've yep, got a bill that's I've going to go one, in committee. Yep, got one. Uh, last year I had the. Uh, uh, victims uh, of a crimes bill that I did that covered a lot of uh, sex abuse crimes and battery, you know, domestic battery, and, and really enhanced the, the the rights of of people who were victims of a crime. One of the sections of that we took out because we really didn't have time to get input from the court system as whether you know, and, and it would deal with when you have a child sex abuse victim, um, the process of of putting them through a deposition by the defense attorney. Uh, you know, the current, the current process, uh, it can be quite intimidating and, and traumatic, you know, to a child to go through, I mean, not only go through that, that defense, uh, wit, you know, testimony in trial, but if you go, I mean, a lot of times victims go through that in the deposition process and, and become so traumatized that, that the prosecutors can't get them to go back, you know, can't get, to go to, get them to go to court. If there's no witness, there's no crime, and so this would really help change the setting of that. Give the give the parents more uh, control over what kind of questions happen in that process. Uh, I mean, there's you all, always have the right to face your accuser, so we got to balance constitutional, uh, you know, protections with you know victims' protections, and and so that that bill that I'll have uh, Senate Bill 206 will be heard next week in judiciary. And I did get, finally, I had been trying to get feedback from the, the uh, Chief Justice Loretta Rush's office for about two months. And, and finally, and, and over Christmas, I said, you know, where's your, you know, where's your feedback? Where's your feedback? Where's your feedback? I finally got it uh, last night. Okay. <laughs> so, 
we'll work through their comments and then try to get that bill ready and, and get it in a, in a way that does protect victims, but, but still you know, gives constitutional protection for people accused of a crime. Okay, now, and you have other bills, but we'll discuss those as, as weeks come and, along. Yep. Uh, but if you'd like to meet uh, State Senator Mark Vesper, or hear more from you and other legislators mm -hmm. on Saturday morning, uh, is, which is the 11th of January mm -hmm. at 9 o'clock at mm -hmm. the C10 building, which is the new building on the campus of Vincennes University Jasper. Mm -hmm. Yep, they've got a it's nice a, auditorium. It's a good it's setting. Great. I mean, the, the, the acoustics are good. And, and, and you're all there. Yep, I uh, think, I think the, both senators and both state reps will be there tomorrow, as far as I know. Everybody's scheduled to be there tomorrow. So it come out with questions. If you want to hear a little bit about all the bills we're working on, House Senate priorities, uh, and then and just open for questions about any other issues. You, you've, if you've heard about bills that got filed that you know that got you concerned, uh, come out tomorrow, and we'll try to we'll try to answer questions on them as best we can. And it's free. Mm -hmm. And all you really got to do is just show up and sit. And you yep. can ask a question by writing it down if mm -hmm. you'd like, or mm -hmm. you can just simply uh, sit there and listen or talk to you afterwards if they Correct. need to. Starts at 9, ends almost always at 10.30. They're mm -hmm. usually pretty prompt about that. Yep. And I appreciate you doing that uh, that as well. And we really appreciate you coming in every Friday. Yep. Look forward Glad to, to do it. it. Look thank forward you. to seeing you right. next week. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Well, I'll see you tomorrow morning. All right. All right. Thank you for watching WJTS Inform. Our guest has been State Senator Mark Mesper. And uh, we encourage you to join us tomorrow at the Jasper Chamber of Commerce Legislative Breakfast. I'm Bill Potter for WJTS. We're local people watching local people.